Okay, so our next speaker is Alexei Beshenov from Simagla, and he's going to uh, and he's going to talk about volatile homology for n less than zero. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much for all the organizers, and it's always a big pleasure for me to to visit Mexico City. Huh? So I'm going to talk about volatile cohomology. And uh, it's some conjectural cohomology theory, which is supposed to encode the special values of uh, arithmetic zeta functions. So what these are? So uh, arithmetic zeta functions have been studied for like many time, but the, probably the most general definition is due to SER. So uh, we started from something which we call an arithmetic scheme. It's a scheme that is separated on a finite type over spec Z. And uh, thanks to this assumption that it's of finite type, it makes sense to, to define the zeta function as follows. So we take this Euler product over all the closed points of X, and uh, we take the size of the residue field at each closed point. And uh, this will be finite fields thanks to the assumption that it's of finite type. No? And this product converges for uh, S, the real part of S greater than the cruel dimension of X. And uh, there is a big conjecture that this uh, function admits a meromorphic continuation to the whole complex plane. No? But it's a big conjecture, of course, and it is known only in some very, very specific cases. No? So these are the arithmetic zeta functions. And uh, uh, there are some special cases that have been studied a lot. So, well, the most famous example is, of course, the Riemann zeta function, is when this scheme is just a spectrum of z. So in this case, the formula that was there is just the usual Euler product for the Riemann zeta function. But of course, like it's difficult to study just the Riemann function. Uh, we would like to have some family of zeta functions. So first family of zeta functions uh, that was defined in the 19th century, and it has been studied in the algebraic number theory, is the Dedekind zeta function. So we take a number field, which is a finite extension of Q, and we take its uh, ring of integers, OF. So the zeta function associated to to this ring of integers is called the Dedekind zeta function. And it's a lot is known for these zeta functions. Well, the most important thing is not known, which is the Riemann hypothesis, but we know quite a lot about these zeta functions. And also there is the Hasse-Weil zeta function. Uh, when x is a variety over a finite field, in this case, uh, if we write down this, uh, the definition of the zeta function, it turns out that it's related to, to this thing, zx, where zx, it's, it's a function which is, we can think of this as a, some generating function which encodes the number of points of our variety over different extensions of uh, fq. And uh, a lot is known about these functions. In particular, we know that it's a rational function. It's a theorem of the work. And uh, veil conjectures uh, tell us about, uh, about uh, they give us a functional equation, they give us uh, information about zeros and poles of this rational function, so uh, a lot is known about, about varieties over finite fields. Huh? So these are the very known particular examples of, uh, of arithmetic zeta functions, but we are quite ambitious and we want to, to say something about the values of of any zeta function associated to any arithmetic scheme. So what are the special... Uh? Are you going to include in, in your kind of family of examples the Gauss zeta functions and uh, positive characteristic? The which, which zeta functions? Gauss. Um, so if you have a Trinfeld module, you can look at... No, 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 I don't think so. I don't think it fits in this in this framework, no? I don't but know. It's interesting because in, in positive characteristic you do have these Hasse-Weil zeta yes. functions. They're, they don't take values in the, uh, 
in the function fields, but they define using function fields. On the other hand, function fields admit very natural zeta functions, which are just Yeah, but it's, uh, I think it's a very different story from what I'm going to do. Oh, yeah, no, yeah. I just, it's just a comment. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah. So, about the special values. So, we fix some integer n, and first, we want we take the vanishing order of this uh, zeta function at n, and then well, sometimes uh, the zeta functions they they tend to have zeros or poles at integers. So if there is a zero pole, what we're gonna do? We're gonna consider the leading Taylor coefficient at this at this point. So this is what is called the special value of at n. No? So, and our goal is basically interpret somehow these numbers. So, oh, sorry, this s should be n. No? So this is the special value at n is uh, this thing. No? So the n will be would be like positive if we have a zero of some order, negative if we have a pole, and it would be zero if there is no zero or pole. No? So these are the the special values. No? And uh, well. There is a lot of work related to the special values of zeta functions, but I'm going to mention just one really classical formula, which was due to Dirichlet, and it was also already known to Gauss. So this is the class number formula. So if you work with the number fields, so we take the Dedekind zeta function, we can ask what is the special value at uh, zero. And... Uh, well, there is a zero of order R1 plus R2 minus 1, where R1 is the number of real places, which means like the real embeddings of uh, our number field, and uh, two R2 is the number of uh, complex places, which come in conjugate pairs. No? And in this case, there is the formula, which is called the class number formula. It says that the special value at zero is this thing. So uh, we have this... Uh, uh, rational number. What is above is what is normally known in number theory as uh, the class number associated to a number field. So this cohomology group will always be finite. And what we have below, well, it's the torsion part of the of the group of units. But well, it's the number of roots of unity that you have in the number field. And uh, the most interesting thing is uh, is this number R F. It's called the Dirichlet regulator, and this is some real number. And well, for me, it's one of the most uh, beautiful formulas in mathematics because it, it relates uh, some object, which is the zeta function, which is something analytical, to some invariants that are algebraic. So, so the idea is basically to, to, to try to generalize this kind of formula to, to other cases. And uh, well, the question is like, what can we, for instance, even in the case of the Dedekind zeta function, how do we write down similar formulas, but, but for different integers, except for n equals zero, no? And a lot of work uh, has been done in this direction. In particular, uh, Borel has, has worked out some, uh, well, he has worked in this direction, and he worked in this direction, and he defined uh, some, uh, higher algebraic invariants that are supposed to, to encode the values at, uh, uh, at other integers, and he defined also higher regulators. Huh? Well, what kinds of uh, invariants are these? That well, the Borel used K-theory, uh, and people, at bit, like in the 70s, they were looking at the algebraic K-theory. But, uh, well, uh, in a moment I will explain that uh, one probably should use motivic homology instead of K-theory which is something like finer than algebraic case theory. So yeah, this is the, but this is the very classical story. So what is uh, Weil et al cohomology? Weil et al cohomology is a conjectural cohomology theory that was proposed by Steven Lichtenbaum in the 2000s. So uh, one suspects, conjectures that there are some cohomology groups that I will denote by HWC, where W is very letal and C is compact support in some sense. And, uh, well, these groups, well, this cohomology theory comes from some perfect complex, which means that these cohomology groups are finitely generated, and uh, 
they vanish for almost all i except for finitely many i. Huh? And uh, one key property of this is that there, is, there should be a long exact sequence of these cohomology groups after we tensor this with R. Huh? So normally these cohomology groups will have some torsion, but after we tensor this with R, with R uh, we will have just some uh, long exact sequence of uh, real vector spaces of finite dimension. And then there is a theory of uh, determinants of uh, perfect complexes, which was uh, developed by Knudsen and Mumford. And uh, basically from this formalism of determinants of complexes, uh, you can see that like, so if this cohomology comes from, from, some, from some complex, then we can take the determinant of uh, this complex, which will be actually like just a free Z module of rank one. And, uh, but what is good is that we will have a canonical isomorphism between R and uh, this free Z module of rank one tensored with R. No? So first conjecture is that the vanishing order at N will be given by this formula, which looks almost like the Euler characteristic, but it's like some, uh, we have some weights here, no? So it's not quite a Euler characteristic, but something similar. So the conjecture is that the vanishing order is encoded in this uh, modified Euler characteristic of this uh, cohomology theory. And what about the special value? The conjecture is that uh, if we take the image the image of uh, the inverse of the special value at n uh, with respect to this uh, isomorphism lambda, then it will give precisely the lattice, which is, which is this one. And since we identify like uh, a z uh, with, with, with uh, z here, this will define this number up to a sign plus or minus one. Huh? Which is not a very big deal, the sign, because normally uh, we have something like uh, we can guess what's what's the sign of the of the special value. Huh? So this is the the formalism that was proposed by by Lichtenbaum. Uh, yes, X uh, in all this story, X is a scheme separated of finite type over spec Z. Yes, yes. So. Uh, some work has been done uh, on defining these cohomology theories. So Lichtenbaum first considered the case of varieties over finite fields. And there is also some work by Thomas Geiser about this. Uh, then also Lichtenbaum considered the case of uh, number rings. And uh, Baptiste Moran uh, considered, constructed uh, Veiletal cohomology for any arithmetic scheme that is proper and regular, and he worked out the case when n equals zero. And then this work uh, has been generalized. So Matthias Lach and Baptiste Moran, they uh, generalized this work to any integer n. So they gave construction of this Veiletal cohomology for proper and regular schemes, and. Uh, uh, in my PhD thesis, I worked out the case where I removed the conjecture that X is proper and regular. So I constructed the Veritale cohomology for any scheme that is separated on a finite type over spec Z. But well, this sounds like very serious. So actually what I did, I considered the case of N strictly negative. No? And it turns out that if N is strictly negative, then uh, some parts of the theory simplify. No? So this is basically the, the idea. No? So you lose something when you remove this assumption of properness and regularity, but then you also gain something when you add this extra assumption that the values that you are interested in are the, at the negative integers. No? So this is, so basically from now on, n will be strictly negative. No? Okay. So, the key ingredient in uh, all this story is the motivic cohomology. And what I'm using, I'm using some version of uh, motivic cohomology that was introduced by Thomas Geiser. And uh, it's something that is called dualizing cycle complexes. But these are complexes of abelian sheaves on the tile side of X. 
So actually it's some kind of variation of Bloch cycle complexes, the really classical definition of Bloch, but this works for over spec Z. No? So normally people doing motivic cohomology are interested in varieties over fields, but we want to, to work over spec Z. No? So the motivation behind this work of Geyser is actually uh, some arithmetic duality theorems. So he generalizes, uh, well, some, some duality theorem in entire cohomology, which is known as uh, Ertin Verdia duality, and he generalizes these to higher dimensional schemes. And for this, he introduces these uh, complexes Z, C, N. No? And uh, what is good about these complexes, they behave like Borel Moore homology. So if we have a decomposition of our scheme X, so we take a closed subscheme Z and we take U, which is its open complement. Then we will have a distinguished triangle. We will have this uh, cohomology of Z, cohomology of X, and cohomology of U. No? And well, maybe Borel-Moore homology is not so well known as the cohomology with compact support, but basically it's the Verdier dual to the cohomology with compact support. No? So for compact support, normally you have U, then X, then Z, and this, this one is like... Uh, is, uh, is the other way. No? So, bad thing about this uh, motivic homology is that the calculations are really few and hard. No? So we know these full calculations only for very specific uh, cases. No? And uh, actually, it is suspected, but it is not even known that these cohomology groups are finitely generated. But to proceed, we need to assume this conjecture that these cohomology groups are finitely generated. So this is some version of uh, a conjecture by Steven Lichtenbaum. So we're going to assume this to, to proceed. OK, so, uh, so what are about these uh, Veletal complexes? No? So assuming the finite generation of motivic cohomology, we can show that there exists some perfect complex uh, R, gamma, R gamma WC which conjecturally gives us the, has the, the desired properties. One important property of this complex that we're gonna use is that if we tensor this complex with R, then it splits, and it splits into two things that are really easy to understand. Well, easy. <laughs> the first part would be just dual to, to the motivic cohomology, and the second part is the cohomology with compact support of uh, this sheaf on the complex points of X. Uh, and we take the equivalent cohomology because like on the complex points of X there will be the complex conjugation. And also, and also we have this, oh, this should be 2 pi i n r, no? sorry. So we take 2 pi i n r and there is also a complex conjugation on, on this guy. No? And we take the, the uh, the equivalent shift cohomology. So, so these complexes will split in this way uh, over R. Huh? And uh, what tensoring line do you expect? Um? Could you put tensoring R? Do you have some expectation what this looks like? Oh, I mean the torsion. The torsion part is really like if you tensor with Q, you get this this thing basically. So the the devil is in the torsion, right? So this is the the problem. So, uh, as I mentioned, uh, in the formalism of Lichtenbaum, we need, a, we need a long exact sequence of these cohomology groups after we tensor with R. And to get this uh, long exact sequence, we need a regulator. Huh? So I'm going to briefly explain what kind of regulators we use. So the regulator morphism. So. Uh, there are many constructions of regulators, and uh, one of the recent works is by Carol Lewis and Miller Stack. So, if the complex fiber of X is smooth and quasi projective, they define some morphism of complexes, which in our situation boils down to this. So, uh, it goes from the motivic cohomology to Borel Moore homology, uh, equivalent Borel Moore homology. Well, and actually, actually, this uh, this is related to the 
thesis of uh, of Matt Kerr, who was a student, uh, who was a student of Philip Griffiths. Uh, so, <laughs> and um, so, uh, well, in general, these regulators they take values in something more complicated, which is the Lin Balinson uh, cohomology or homology. But in all this story, n is strictly negative, and in this case, we can see that thanks to this, the the target of this morphism is much simpler than than the Lin Balinson. And uh, what is good about this regulator? Well, Balinson conjectures that if we take the dual of this morphism, then it gives us a quasi-isomorphism of complexes. So, assuming the finite generation of, uh, of uh, these things, they will, of course, there will be some torsion, but after we tensor with R, we suspect that this will be, the corresponding cohomologies will be, will be of the same dimensions, right? So, this is the conjecture of, uh, of Bailinson. And uh, basically, this, that result that I mentioned that uh, the splitting over R plus the Bailinson's conjecture, it allows us to define in some obvious way this uh, long exact sequence. This is because uh, after tensoring with R, the splitting gives us this part and that part. No? So we define more or less in the obvious way using the regulator, uh, this, uh, we get this long exact sequence. No? Okay, so this is the regulator. So what is the conjecture? What do we conjecture about all this? So let's assume that there is a meromorphic continuation of the zeta function around some negative integer n. Then for the regulator to exist, let's assume that the complex fiber is smooth and quasi-projective. And let's assume that the Lichtenbaum's conjecture about the finite generation of motivic homology and the Billingson's conjecture about, about the regulator. So in this case, we conjecture that, that this holds, no? that this formula gives the uh, vanishing order and this one gives us precisely, precisely the special value up to sign. No? And uh, well, one comment. Uh, thanks to that splitting of, uh, over R, and thanks to the Billingstone's conjecture, we can figure out that, well, this formula is, will be just equivalent to this one. And this one is just the, the usual Euler characteristics of the cohomology, equivalent cohomology with compact support. So at least for the vanishing order, this conjecture is really, is really clear, right? Like these groups are, it's, it's quite easy to figure out what these are, to calculate this, and uh, we conjecture that the Euler characteristics of this cohomology with compact support is precisely the, the vanishing order. So, okay. And well, this sounds kind of, kind of weird because, I mean, we assumed some really difficult conjectures like meromorphic continuation, finite generation of motivic cohomology, and Billingson's conjecture, so, uh, why do we formulate yet another conjecture, right? <laughs> so this is the, well, basically the answer is the following. So, well, first, this is a generalization of some of the conjecture that was formulated for, by Flach and Moran for the case when X is proper and regular. And then uh, there is also the Tamagawa number conjecture formulated by Bloch, Kato, then Fontaine and perrin -Liu. And uh, well, this Tamagawa number conjecture is about slightly different objects, but whenever it makes sense to compare our conjecture with that one, they turn to be compatible. No? So, mm. and uh, the most uh, interesting thing is the, fo is the following. So, it turns out that our conjecture is well behaved under this decomposition. So, if we take this, what I call like closed open decomposition, again, like Z is a closed subscheme, U is its open complement. Then it's obvious from the definition of the zeta function that the zeta function associated to X is the product of the zeta function associated to, to Z and to U. Huh? 
just because this function is the product over the closed points. No? So, but since this holds, one suspects that all these conjectures about spatial values should be also compatible with this stuff. And in our case, we should prove uh, that this is the case. So, if this conjecture is true for it's true for x, if and only, and only if it is true for z, and it is true for u. And thanks to this machinery, we can play this the following game. So, uh, well, we know that uh, it reduces to the Tamagawa number conjecture is in some cases, and. Uh, we know, we know that this conjecture holds for some very specific uh, situations. Uh, but now using these uh, closed open decompositions, we can construct new schemes that for which this conjecture will be automatically proved, right? Taking as, a, as the input the known cases no, of these conjectures. So this is basically the main like uh, um, non-conjectural output of, of all this work. And uh, I don't know if I still have like five minutes or. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> so, well, basically, I, I I just want to mention how these complexes are constructed, how this cohomology theory is constructed, and it's not because I'm really proud of this construction, but precisely to show that the definition we have at the moment is is far from being uh, perfect. So. So the idea is the following. We define some specific et al shift uh, on X, which is defined using the shifts of uh, roots of unity. And then, but basically, this diagram is the whole definition. So <laughs> we take the motivic cohomology, we take its Q dual, and then using some duality results by Geyser, we, can, we construct some morphism that goes from, from this to the etal cohomology with compact support of this uh, shift defined using uh, shifts of roots of unity. And then we take a cone of uh, this morphism in the derived category of abelian groups. Well, everyone who works with derived category knows that uh, nobody should talk about the cone of a morphism because it's, it's not well defined. No? But in this case, since this is a Q-dual, it's just some Q, complex of Q-vector spaces. Uh, this will be uh, Q mod Z dual to some finally generated abelian groups. And in this case, we, one can show that actually this cone, in this case, it's well-defined up to a unique isomorphism in the derived category. No? But then what we do, uh, we can, there is a comparison theorem between the etal cohomology and uh, uh, singular cohomology of the complex points of a scheme. And using this comparison theorem of Artin, we can uh, build a morphism that goes from here to the cohomology of compact support uh, on the complex points. Huh? And uh, then uh, the difficult part is to show that the composition of these two morphisms is zero. And once we know this, which is actually a difficult uh, result, we can just formally, using the axioms of the right categories, say that, okay, so, Let's take the bottom distinguished triangle, this one with, with the identity morphism here, and then there will be some morphism between these two guys. No? But this morphism, actually, it's kind of a mysterious thing because we know that it exists, but we can't say much about this. We just know that it exists as a morphism in the derived category. And then we take its mapping fiber and we declare that this is, this is the Veletal complex. No? But because of these kind of uh, usual issues with homological algebra, this guy is not well defined because we just take a mapping fiber of some morphism in the derived category. Huh? But all this formalism is concerned with the determinants of complexes and not complexes themselves. And the determinants, they are well behaved uh, with the distinguished triangles. No? So at the end of the day, we are OK if we are just interested in this determinant stuff. But yeah, I think this is not the best possible construction one can think of. No? Okay. And then uh, some questions that are left. So, well, first question is like, I mentioned that this regulator is defined for, non for a, the, the case when X has a smooth fiber over C. 
So the question is like, uh, can we work out the regulator morphism for the non-smooth case? And actually, there is some work of Kerr and Lewis that they, they, they consider the non-smooth case, no? But, yeah, I, I think there is no, like, uh, general construction in the literature, and it probably requires some work to, like, to fit all the pieces together and uh, plug into our machinery uh, this uh, generalized regulator, no? And... Uh, yeah, I think uh, Professor Griffiths would probably <laughs> comment on this, but well. And then uh, uh, <clears throat> another question is, this definition that I showed, I showed it precisely not to torture you with the details, but only to show that it's kind of ad hoc, the definition that we have now. We just do something with complexes of abelian groups, and, and uh, so from the very beginning when Lichtenbaum was proposing this valetal formalism, he was proposing actually very little topology. So actually one suspects that there, behind all of these things there is a growth and topology. No? But it's, it requires some better understanding of the geometry behind everything to, to define. No? And there is some work uh, of Matthias Flach and Baptiste Moran in this direction, but yeah, it's still, it's still far from, from, from being complete now. So basically, these are the the two questions that I have now. And uh, thank you very much. Questions? Maybe, uh, is there some, maybe, already, but can you, is there some relationship between PSD architecture with your formalism? Uh, yes. There is a student of uh, Matthias Flach who considered this particular case the compatibility of their conjectures with the BSD. Yes, yes. There is definitely a relation, and uh, it was checked that this, this, the, some compatibility between these two things uh, was checked. Yes. Huh? Oh, well, basically my formalism, what I was talking about, it's just some extension of, uh, of some work of Matthias Lach and Baptiste Moran, and they already consider the case when the scheme is uh, proper and regular. So basically what I'm talking about is like that just thinking carefully about their ideas, you can generalize everything to this non-proper, non-regular case, but basically, uh, yeah, it's... What do you mean? Okay. Like, like yeah, I mean the the idea, the idea is the following. Yeah, yeah. You take like uh, the like a module of an elliptic curve, and then you you apply everything for this module, like without like reducing it to different primes. No, yeah. I mean, yeah.